Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our virtual history talks. Today, we are traveling up the coast to Casa Romanta Cultural Center and Gardens up in San Clemente. We have with us tonight Kathy, the Director of Education and Visitor Services, and Lou, who's one of their docents. Feel free to pop any questions you have while you watch the video in the chat, and then we'll open it up at the end for that. Kathy and Lou, would you like to say anything before we get started here? Well, I'd just like to welcome you all um, to our presentation. We just put this video together. This is something new for us, and I, we really hope you enjoy it. Um, this um, home um, is the jewel of San Clemente. We're very proud of it. We're proud that we are able to continue to thrive here. Um, we are um, an award-winning cultural center. We uh, do all kinds of different things here. So at the end, we'll be happy to share some of our fun events and things that are going to be coming up over the next few months that you might want to come and join us for. I know it's a little bit of a drive, but it, you might find it's worth it. Um, and um, just the house and the view are pretty incredible. I feel so fortunate that I get to be here every day um, and get paid to have the wonderful view. Lou, did you want to add anything or? I'll leave it for the for the video first, and then I'm happy to share any stories. Uh, people have uh, questions, I can probably ad lib and give you a lot of other little anecdotal comments as well. Perfect, let me pull up the video. Welcome to Casa Romanica, the summer home of the founder of St. Committee, Oli Hansen. As we enter the keyhole door section, Pay close attention, that's Moorish design, the only aspect of the facility that is not Spanish colonial revival architecture. The coral tree that used to be the greeting tree out front was original to the property and that became the official tree of the San Clemente by nature of the fact that Moli planted it in front of his home. The fountain outside has four ceramic frogs that emulate the frogs in the fountain that we'll see later in the interior of the house that was original to the home. in St. Clemente and are unique and original to the property. Some of the original palm trees, uh, some of the palm trees you see are original to the property and are quite mature in their growth now. As uh, we see in some of the original photographs in the courtyard, which is 5,400 square feet, we see an original reflecting pool that now does not exist for, so we can have other kinds of social events and activities here. Discovery Gallery that you will find a uh, focus on the original plot plan as created by Oli in 1927-28, the original desk that he used uh, in his offices, and a number of historical exhibits on Richard Nixon, since Richard Nixon used the city of St. Clemente uh, and claimed it as his own for the Western White House during the presidential uh, administration. As 
as we walk along, we see two original oil paintings on canvas that were done by Norman Kennedy and that were commissioned and made specifically for this home. Out into the main salon, which is sometimes referred to as a solarium for the natural light that comes inside, we mentioned the fountain before, and now we see it inside with the four small ceramic frogs. The chandelier, which predates the property, is older than the property, was purchased by Mrs. Hansen, rumored to be from an antique store in Nevada. A quick stop into the dining room uh, shows uh, the, one of the original three pieces of furniture that we have on the property. Redwood ceiling, again, original to the property. Those redwood uh, beams are held up by iron stars. Some people think that uh, they are star-shaped as Ole was paying homage to the Norwegian star since his family background, they originally came from Norway. And more interesting is the butler button that's in the floor that was installed by Ole to signal his uh, cooks and waiting staff when it was time to serve the next part of the dinner. The fireplace and the pocket doors are unique and planned area originally for entertaining. By having pocket doors, they can be slid open and uh, hidden. Through the hallway, there's a number of Mary Colby antiques from her original collection as we enter. was uh, Oli's office. I would say that I don't know how he got any work done because the view out to the San Clemente Pier is absolutely spectacular. It provide, I believe, quite a bit of distraction. Oli's bedroom, he had his own private bedroom. A bath. Take a look, uh, you can see the authentic and original 1920 style bathtub, and more importantly, a very large walk-in shower, as well as the uh, Catalina tiles that are original to the property. We're gonna comment a little bit later on this uh, walk-in shower in the end. Down the hall to his wife Nellie's bedroom, uh, she had a great love for Chinese furniture. Some of those pieces still are, are in here to complement her tastes. One of the other original pieces of furniture, which is the daughter's oak chest. Without featuring that, pay close attention. There, each of the bedrooms have walk-in closets, very unusual to the era, and uh, specific to the property. And then Mrs. Hansen also had her own private bathroom as well, similar but different color tile. Out the double doors into the cactus garden, uh, way to the gallery. The gallery has rotating exhibits throughout the year. Typically, they stay here for 80 to 90 days. We've had some very unique and very impressive 
uh, properties, so exclusive exhibits that uh, we welcome our guests back often. gallery, which was originally part of the bedrooms for the children, as you can see from some of the historical photographs. go into the butterfly garden which is an official way station for the monarch butterflies as they migrate uh, from Canada to Mexico. Along the side path through one of our gardens, I'll probably mention more than once that we have over 30 gardens, uh, specific gardens on the property that uh, people can wander and enjoy to their liking. One of them is the Spanky Chang Garden. To look carefully to find Spanky in the garden. Down to our story circle where we entertain children on a regular basis by having storybook readings. to the ocean terrace. Important to pay attention to is the, the, the flourishing bougainvillea, which is the official flower of the city of Saint. We have uh, one of the early, early El Camino Real bells that mark the entire path of the Mission Trail. Around the corner, we'll go to our spectacular barrel cactus area. 
Also, we have a herb garden. We go down into an area that we can refer to as the native home. comment a little bit more about the history of uh, Casa Ramonica and Ole Hansen. This, again, the summer home was built between 1927 and 28, and it was uh, the residence, summer residence of Ole Hansen and, uh, and his wife with eight of their 11 children. Numerous pets were on the property. We might have seen uh, ponies, peacocks on the roof, uh, exotic fish and some of the reflecting pools. I understand there was a monkey and uh, there was even an alligator on the property, but that's a story for a different day. <laughs> the beautiful butterfly garden sculpture was generously donated by some of our volunteers, uh, specifically for this location. Also pays a little bit of homage to the monarch butterfly as that was mentioned earlier. Follow along on the Woodland Garden Path to the Monterey Cypress that are from the grounds of the former Western White House. You can stop and take a look at the amphitheater that was built in 2007 and in more recent years had more than 80 seats installed for a lot of our cultural activities. Ole Hansen, while not an original resident of St. Domini, basically his history is he was a former mayor of Seattle, spent some time uh, going around the country speaking, was hired by William Randolph Hearst to interview Pancho Villa, Thomas Edison, and Theodore Roosevelt. He uh, had some successful uh, development projects that he had done, both in Santa Barbara uh, in Los Angeles before he had the inspiration to build a Spanish village by the sea and uh, helped create a syndicate with his partner in Hamilton H. Cotton where they acquired over five and a half miles of uh, oceanfront and he started to develop San Clemente as a uh, possible retirement home, second home, summer home for folks, uh, probably mostly targeted folks from San Diego and Los Angeles, since geographically, San Clemente is located halfway between the two. I hope that you've enjoyed the tour today and will come and visit us because there's a lot more to see and learn Wonderful. Thank you guys for doing that video. Nothing beats seeing it and those beautiful views. So would you like to add anything or start opening it up to questions? I'll, I'll add a couple things. It, it, it is the view. I mean, the view is absolutely spectacular. And I say uh, on our clearest months that uh, it's common to see uh, Santa Catalina Island, which is 30 miles away. And on a really crystal clear day, we can see San Clemente Island, which is 50 miles away. And that is the origin of the name of our city. You know, the island was already there and named, and uh, Ole just copied that and referred to you know, his new settlement as San Clemente. I'll open it up for some questions and then I can always elaborate a little bit. I'll think of some things as we go. I have a question to start us off. What was early San Clemente like? Well, it was a pretty small town. Uh, basically it was, uh, you wanna call it a master plan. As Kathy mentioned earlier, there was a whole plot plan that was developed. Uh, when you think about uh, the early Think about some of the early projects in the respect like people sell timeshares now where they invite folks to come and hear a sales presentation. Uh, that's really what they were doing because uh, there was nothing here other than you know natural 
hillsides, rolling hillsides, and beautiful beach areas. So what they did was they developed uh, all of the, the plot plan with, with streets. And our plot plan is not the typical grid that you would find in cities where it's uh, in squares, north streets running north and south or east and west. He really commissioned his uh, surveyors and the folks who were cutting, uh, cutting streets to take advantage of the natural curvatures of the hillsides, mountains, and also to make sure that there was a lot of spectacular vistas because he wanted this to be a really special place. He created the pier before the city. So we have over 1300 feet of pier, it's still wooden. He developed that first. He created uh, the municipal golf course. He built a hospital and uh, he had the waterworks installed and all of that was in place before they sold their very first lot. And they, uh, as I mentioned in the, uh, the narration of the video, the, probably the, the majority of the target audience was where you live in San Diego all the way up to Los Angeles because geographically people could you know, get halfway and it might be some place that they would find appealing for that second home or relocation because there were, there was no industry, there was nothing here. Um, uh, the, 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 the interesting part was, it was almost like, a, almost like a tent revival. He had a tent erected, a sales tent. He'd come in, he was not really comfortable in the beginning being a public speaker. He would kind of talk about the vision of what he had in mind for the city, which ultimately was targeted to be 60,000 people. But probably during his time, there probably were no more than about 3,000 people ever here. People selected their own lot. Uh, a lot may have cost, a view lot in San Camini may have cost $500. And uh, then you could choose from about five different contractors to have your home built. Some of the lots were very small and they were cottages. Some of the, pro some of the properties, uh, the lots were much larger. And so the homes of course were larger as well. But the, uh, the mandatory part of the contract that you signed as someone who bought a, a lot from uh, Ole Hansen was that you had to build in the Spanish colonial revival architecture. So it had to have all the attributes of uh, the thick walls, the whitewashed walls, the red tile roofs, maybe arches, all in proportion to whatever size of the home that was being built. But that was you know, mandated because of his vision of having this uh, Spanish village by the sea. Now to induce people to come here, again, it reminds me of you know, early days before timeshares, what was the encouragement? In his ads and in his invitation, he says, if you come and listen to my vision, I will buy you a chicken dinner. <laughs> and and uh, people came. And it's pretty obvious that more people came. They say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, a lot of people must have come for free lunch because uh, we have... Uh, we have a copy of the earliest newspaper that said within the first 10 months of him inviting people here, Ole had served 80,000 chicken dinners. Wow. So you got, you got chicken, a vegetable, a cup of coffee, and a slice of pie. And I guess uh, it's kind of like getting, going to Florida and, here, and getting your free Disneyland tickets if you listen to the timeshare sales now. It really hasn't changed. There's a lot more people listen to the sales pitch than actually bought a lot. And, and, I, and I think that's, that's pretty interesting. Awesome. So we have a question on how many square feet the home is. How many square feet? The house is. The house has 7,200 square feet yes. of indoor living spaces. And when you count the courtyard, that's another 5,400 square feet. And originally it was a five acre property. You know, obviously, you know, our camera stays pretty tight on some of the gardens because there are, there are buildings, you know, that have been built since then that are erected on each side. Uh, Ole 
didn't stay here very long. He's only here for a few years. He was probably gone by 1933 by nature of what happened in 1929. You know, the depression hurt this area quite a bit. And a lot of people moved away about, about that time out of maybe the 3,000 people that originally settled here and built individual homes, it might have got down to about 1,200 people in population. Uh, and so there was, uh, since Oli and his family were here, there were another seven subsequent owners of the property. And through those years, uh, different families divested of some of the surrounding property around it. So, you know, we're very fortunate that we still have what we have here and in, in the small acreage that we do, but we have neighbors on each side now as well. So how long it, was it lived in total before it became the, the museum? Well, there were different residents here and it, it was repurposed a couple times, but thankfully mm -hmm. all of the people who lived here really did respect the property. I'm not so sure because of the historical significance or why, but we're very fortunate that they didn't chop it up. They didn't add a lot of doors. They didn't knock out walls and things like that. We're very fortunate that, and why, I, why we talk about it in the, in the video tour is there's so much here that's original. The wood floors, the redwood ceilings, you know, all the walls, things like that. Um, it, was, it was a home at different times and we had interesting people living here. Uh, Fred Waring, the band leader, his ex-wife lived here, Mrs. Fred Waring. Um, we had uh, the last family that was here, lived here with their children. We've even had one of their children come back, uh, who looks like me now at his age, uh, but he who talks about living here on the property. Uh, that was the Welsh family. And what I like to talk about, and it, it always uh, sparks a thought in uh, a lot of our Los Angeles folks. He worked for Helms Bakery. And, you know, Helms was a, a big, a lar very large bakery concern in Los Angeles. And they had all the, the trucks that drove into the neighborhoods and tweeted the whistle and sold to all of us kids uh, a donut out of the back of the truck or a loaf of bread for mom right there in the neighborhood. Uh, they also turned that property into uh, an elder care property. So we have visitors, family visitors and other folks that come back and say, gee, you know, auntie lived here during that time or my aunt and my mom was here. Uh, and so after they, the Welshers moved out, they turned it into an elder care property. And around 1989 is when they elected mm -hmm. to divest of the property and uh, there was a, an interested buyer at the time who wanted to purchase it and turn it into a Mexican restaurant. And not that we're not in favor of Mexican restaurants, but there was you know, a bit of a, a flag went up saying, this is the most significant home for the historical value in the city of San Clemente. This is our history. Uh, we need to retain this. And so with the help of an anonymous donor, uh, that gave us a significant amount of money to, to jumpstart the acquisition. Uh, it helped the city of San Clemente actually purchase this property and, uh, and, and turn it into the cultural center. It took them a couple of years to, 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 to do that. And the agreement is it's actually managed and, and, and run by a nonprofit, but this is a city of San Clemente owned property. Um, in 89, the Welshers sold it to the city, 1989. Um, the Welshers actually owned it for 30 years. They brought it on Christmas Eve in 1959. And depending on who you listen to, they bought it for somewhere between 65 and $112,000. Um, Mark Welsh told us 112, all the paperwork we had said 65. Um, but whatever, when they sold it for $1.5 million, they made a nice profit. Um, and at the time that they owned it, they had signed a 20 year lease with an events um, person who ran weddings out of here. And so at that time, that lease still had another 10 years on it and the city had to honor that lease. So it was 1999 when we were able to come in, restore it and 
the nonprofit was formed then, restored it, and then in 2000, sometime in 2002 to 2003, it was opened as the cultural center um, for people to come visit. For some reason, we cannot seem to find the date that it actually opened the doors. Um, we just know when we had the, the first um, big fundraiser um, event here, which was in um, September of 2002. So, um, you know, we have some questions on when it actually took place, but um, as far as the actual opening, but we believe sometime in late 2002, early 2003, it opened. And um, it's going strong um, right now. Um, has a lot of, of, like I said, a lot of activities. Um, and um, there were, it sat empty from 1934 to 1941. Um, it was, he was at, this was property was foreclosed on, but only made a deal with the bank. It was the Bank of Italy at the time. It's now Bank of America. Giannini. Yeah, Giannini. He, um, and the agreement with um, him was that he would take the burden of being foreclosed on for his home as long as the city was left with no debts. So the city actually came through the depression as a city better than he did. Um, fortunately, he still had a home in Los Angeles that he returned to. And then he did go on to develop um, some properties out in the desert in the 29 Palms yes. area? 29, 29 Palms, Palms area. Palms. Um, and uh, so he did do that before his death of a heart attack in uh, 1940 uh, in Los Angeles. Um, but it did sit empty for quite a while. Giannini, that, that's how you say his name, the bank president, actually used this as his little vacation home occasionally since the bank owned it. Um, and he would bring his family. And I actually had one of his granddaughters here who remembered coming as a small child um, in the 1930s and she was visiting and she says, oh, I remember staying here. So um, it's kind of fun. We get a lot of interesting people visiting who have been here over the years. Let me go back a little bit to the property or the thought and, and what makes it so interesting to, to take uh, folks on tour here is be, again, because there was nothing here and they had to develop everything they had to create industry as well. They had to create, uh, for those who want to live here full time, they had to create jobs, they had to you know, build a city around all of this. So, and the tour, it talks about uh, beautiful tiles, the different designs, the encaustic tile. Those were made in the San Camini tile factory right here in town. So they had to create that. The three pieces of furniture that, that are pointed out, the dining room table, the hope chest, uh, his desk were made in the San Camini furniture factory that was owned by one of the one of the other founders as well. So that's 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 pretty unique. The 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 tile, the roof tile, the red tiles that are here, those were made on the property. And if we uh, when we have to do tile work or roof work, we'll pull we can pull one of those tiles off turn it upside down and they can still see the denim pattern on the inside of it and possibly the seam from someone's denim jeans where they put that wet adobe and formed it over their thigh to get that curve to make those tiles. That's just one more interesting thing, you know, to talk about uh, that's pretty localized here. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. We had a question on how much does it cost to come visit? $5. Only $5. It's a bargain. Yes, a real bargain. That includes our art gallery, um, the home, the grounds. So it's a great, great deal. Um, our art gallery until the 15th of November has the work of Nellie Gail Moulton, um, who we have just recently found out was a ninth cousin of Ole Hansen's oh. wife. Um, which we think is pretty neat. Uh, we don't know that they knew each other. Well, they probably knew each other, but they um, don't know that they knew they were related. Um, Nellie Gale Moulton, for anyone of you who drive the five freeway, may be familiar with Nellie Gale Ranch. That's a very um, exclusive gated community in Laguna Niguel. Um, and then Moulton Parkway is one of the main thoroughfares from Dana Point um, going all the way up to Irvine that people use if the five is crowded. 
Uh, but the Malton family owned 22,000 acres of ranch land and she um, loved to paint and she was very prolific in her art and actually founded a lot of the, and was involved with the Laguna art colony for many years. Um, so we have a lot of connective history with this exhibit. Um, we've had the Irvine collection here. Uh, we had a fabulous exhibit um, curated by, um, created by Rebecca Louise Law. She's from London and she had us, um, our, our whole art gallery was filled with hanging flowers and um, shells. It was just an amazing, um, people always come back and ask when we're gonna do it again, because it was real fun. You could walk through the flowers. Um, and after two months, it didn't smell as good as it did in the beginning, but it was definitely a, a great exhibit. Um, so um, it's really special that we get to have all these exhibits here. I mean, what used to be two bedrooms and two bathrooms. And, and I'd like to add as well that there's some fun things that we have on exhibit on occasion. Uh, to me, one of the real fun ones was a, an exhibit on vintage Hawaiian shirts and different shapes of ukuleles. You know, we have a lot of surf culture. San Kameni is known worldwide for the surf conditions. People come here from all over the globe to surf this area. And so we pay a little bit of tribute to that on occasion as well. When you look at the video or when you come here and you walk through the solarium or even in the discovery gallery, you could see briefly in the, in the photographic, in the video tour that there's a lot of photographs on the wall with a lot of uh, different uh, bylines to them. And they're, they're very specific to different areas or parts of history in San Kameni. We devote some time to uh, Richard Nixon. We've got some historical photographs. There's, there's an original, uh, just some original pictures of the Welshes, the last family who lived here. I mentioned the surfing part. Uh, you know, we have some real surfing pioneers. You know, we've got a surfing heritage museum in San Kameni. But that we have photographs of some of the earliest of the beach characters, you know, that are known globally, that have been mm -hmm. published a lot in a lot of surf magazines. Camp Pendleton is our neighbor, even though it's in San Diego County. And so there's an area that talks a little bit about, you know, that particular neighbor and even some of the war effort and a couple of photographs that kind of show the Rosie the Riveter connection on that as well. Kathy mentioned the, the indigenous people, the Native Americans that were here, the Wahashamans. And there's an area that has some photographs of some of the indigenous peoples and some of their homes that were built right along the creeks nearby here. So there's, uh, there's a lot of different photographs that are self-entertaining, if you will. You can spend as much time as you want or as little time as, as, you, as you please because the view is spectacular and there's you know, great, uh, great amount of time spent on that, on that rear terrace that people just go out and just uh, you know, bask in that view of, uh, of San Kameni, you know, and possibly take a look at the islands on a good day as well. Yeah. Real rare day, we can see some whales migrating, but don't quote me on that. It's not that often, you know, but uh, they're out there. Does anyone else have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself or throw them in the chat here. I noticed nobody really mentioned anything about Richard next door or asked about him. We usually get asked, was this the Western White House? <laughs> no, it was not. Richard Nixon purchased Casa Pacifica, which is the sister house to our house, um, built at the same time by Ole Hansen's um, business partner, Hamilton Cotton. And it's about three miles south of here on Cotton's Point, but it was the same architect builder that did that house. It has most of the same tiles, most of the same features. Uh, it's bigger. It's a little over 9,000 square feet, um, a lot more property. Uh, it is meticulously maintained, absolutely spectacular. And one of the... Um, uh, I got the privilege of visiting it a year ago and, and I took my mother um, and she just couldn't get over being there. But the um, owner happens to own a place called Rogers Garden, which is in 
Newport Beach and it's uh, meticulous in the gardening there. It's just absolutely beautiful, um, but it's privately owned. So we can't, um, you know, people can't just go there. So they do get a good flavor of that house by coming here because so much of it is similar. Um, it is for sale, however, if you have a little over 60 million in your pocket. So but you get five acres and your own private small scale golf course as well. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So we'll all pull our money and maybe we can go over there. And yeah. <laughs> Here's a question. And have, yeah, another question? Yeah, Where were there any particular architects involved in San Clemente land development? Yes, there were. Um, Carl Lindbaum was the architect that happened to design this home and the Western White House and several others. Virgil Westbrook also was involved. And a couple interesting things about him is he was also an, a pilot and he flew over to do the survey of the land, but he designed, um, he helped design our community center. He designed our beach club, um, which by the way, was used for Olympic practices back in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and and a, a several private homes he designed. Um, he, what was rare was he was a, a black man that was designing these homes back in the 1920s. And you didn't see architects that were black too often um, back then. And he was um, very well known. I happened to come into possession of one of his elevations, a framed elevation of a home he designed that no longer exists called The Clouds. Um, and it was a spectacular drawing. It really was, he was quite talented. Um, so they were probably Virgil Westbrook and the, um, this other good guy, um, Lon Lindbaum were the primary architects. Can I elaborate for a second on, since you mentioned North Beach, you know, San Clemente in the thirties and the forties was quite the playground for Hollywood. This was a destination. A lot of people came here stayed in the hotels. We had a casino, which not a gambling casino, but a casino similar to what was on Santa Catalina Island. So it had uh, a, you know, a bandstand, they had big orchestras, uh, the, the, the glitterati of uh, Hollywood would come down here and stay in our Olympic sized pool, both Johnny Weissmuller and Buster Crabb who were training for the Olympics and later became actors, they became Tarzans, you know, practiced mm -hmm. here. We had, uh, it was not uncommon to, to see Clark Gable, Carol Lombard, you know, down here dancing at the casino or whatever else. Back during the time, even earlier than that, I'll regress for a second, when Oli had as I mentioned earlier, he created the waterworks, the municipal golf course, the hospital, the first school. He donated all of that to the city for $1 when they were incorporated. And so in the very late 20s, before the depression, San Kameni was perceived as the wealthiest city in America. Per capita, yes. Because they had no encumbrances. They had no long-term debt. They didn't owe on anything. The streets were in, the waterworks were in. And talking about the streets and the plot, even, even regressing further, when uh, he, he first designed that plot, the, the plot with all the curved streets or whatever else, Oli was a big fan of aerial photography. He had a friend who was a pilot. Who, that was Virgil. Okay, and he would fly over and take photographs of what this was going to look like. They could not afford to pave all the streets at that time. So Oli paid to have the dirt streets whitewashed so that from the air, the contrast, he wasn't trying to deceive anyone, but he, he just for the, the contrast in color made it that much easier to perceive what those neighborhoods were gonna look like. And I find that pretty interesting too. Pretty progressive guy. Very interesting. All right, any other questions? All right, then we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you so much, Lou and Kathy. This was wonderful. Really enjoyed learning about you guys and hope to come visit soon. Come and see us. Definitely. Our next virtual history talks, we will be traveling 
um, up Northern California to the old gold rush town, Columbia State Historic Park. That's gonna be on Wednesday, November 18th at 7 p.m. Um, Columbia has the largest collection of gold rush era buildings still um, standing in the state and a park ranger is going to be giving us the presentation. So make sure you come back for that. Um, History Talks is a donation-based program. So there is a donation link in the chat if you feel like giving to the Gaslamp Historical Foundation today. We greatly appreciate it. And we hope you go visit our friends up in Casa Romantica as well. Thank you, everybody. Come and see us.